Hey friends, how's it going? This is David Potts with Song Notes, and a quick lesson today where I want to talk about the major scale and the different positions all over the fretboard you can play this major scale. Now this has been something I've been practicing the last few weeks. It's the first time I've really spent time with it in over 10 years, so a lot of getting caught up on things. And here's the main takeaway I want to sort of share with you here, um, and this is something a lot of other teachers I don't think spend enough time hammering home. So if you look at this idea of scale positions, right, all different teachers are saying, showing you the different positions on the fretboard that you can play the major scale in any one key. You know, they'll, they'll name these positions, position one, two, three, four, or five, or maybe they call them shapes or forms, whatever they're called. Um, I found this confusing. It seems academic to me. Like, how am I supposed to remember what position one is, what position four is? And especially because different teachers might call these numbers, you know, these labels something different. Um, it makes it all confusing, in my opinion. But then a realization dawned upon me looking at these. Previously, I made this lesson on the caged chord shapes, right? And this, again, was something I had sort of neglected. Now, caged is a pattern of chord shapes that repeats no matter which key you're in. And if, whether you call it caged or not, this same pattern repeats. And what it does is it sort of makes you realize that, oh, there's these same predictable ways I can play the major chord. Uh, if I'm playing the key of C, I can play it open. This is a C shape. I can play it right here. This is an A shape. I can play it right here. That's a G shape, you know, and so on and so forth. And from each of those cage chord shapes, you can play a major scale, right? So this takes this idea of scale positions, and it gives you a new lens to look at it through, right? So say I'm playing this version of E major, right? This is 7999. This is an E major chord. Now, now that I know about the cage chord shapes, I can say, oh, this is an A-shaped chord, right? Because it's using this, this, this A shape. If I need to play a major scale, and I'm looking at Justin Sander Coe's major scale positions, I'm realizing, like, oh, that's just position four. Right? And then I'm looking more at Justin's, Justin Sander Coe's guitar uh, major scale positions, and say I'm looking at position one, okay? And I'm realizing, that, oh, in the cage world, that's just the E shape, right? So say I'm playing this uh, B major chord, seven, nine, nine, eight, seven, seven. Or maybe I'm playing an A, five, seven, seven, six, five, five. Or maybe I'm playing a G. It doesn't matter which major chord I'm playing because if I'm using this shape, this is always the E-shaped major chord, right? Using the cage system. And then I can just look at this new chart I made and say, oh, this is basically gonna use position one. Now it's helpful to know it's position one according to Justin Sanderko's um, excellent website and everything, but the position numbers, aren't as helpful to me as understanding the chord shape that these positions map to. This has really opened things up. So I have made this new PDF. You can see it right here. And I had so much fun making this and it was so helpful to me. I actually had it printed out in a bigger form here just because I want to put this in my office because this has been so tremendously helpful. I just want to be able to glance at this wherever I'm sitting. Um, the large size helps. So in this lesson, what I'm going to do is talk about the major scale and the different positions on the fretboard you can play it. Okay, now I'll call them position one, two, three, four, five to map, for example, to what Justin Sandrico teaches, but I'm less concerned with the position numbers and more concerned with how these position numbers map to the caged chord shapes. So if the cage, the idea of cage is new to you, check out my lesson on that. It's lesson 385 on my website. I have this, this printout you can get, and it basically shows you um, how these, these forms repeat over the fretboard. There's a video lesson that goes along with it. I'll also say, if you don't have um, an understanding of the 12 notes too well in the fretboard, I have a lesson on that as well. This is lesson, what is it, three, 356. This is a good one just to look at the fretboard and get an idea of where the notes are and understand how they repeat. And this is really helpful because when it comes to the concept of root notes, right? When you look at my new PDF and you see a one, that means it's the root note. And that's the note of the same name of whatever key you're in. So if I, if I say, hey, play a, a G root note on the sixth string. Well, here's your sixth string. Where's your G? It's gonna, this lesson sort of requires you to have a basic understanding of that. So you could look at my diagram here and say, oh, G is gonna be the third fret. Okay, and then if we were to play a major scale that needed a root note on the sixth string, we could see, oh, position one has that, right? Or the E shape has that. The E shaped chord would be this for G major. It would be this for A major because the fifth fret 
of the six strings A, and so on and so forth. So again, all these things connect, and this has been a helpful batch of realizations I've had. In the rest of this lesson, I'm gonna get into it, but if you want to get this PDF over at my website, it's lesson 384. This first page gives you a look at the different scale positions as they map to different caged chord shapes, right? And then on the other pages, two, three, four, five, six, I go through each of the five positions, one at a time. And I show you a diagram showing you the intervals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they repeat. And then another diagram showing you the finger numbers. So that way, if you wanna practice any of the five positions, they are there for you to practice. And finally, on page seven, I have this diagram, which shows you, it's similar to page one, but it's showing you this top fretboard, just the pattern of intervals. And when you see this, it, it lets you look at each of these individual positions down here, these chord positions, and sort of see, okay, this is the chaos. How can we slice this chaos into manageable chunks? And these are the chunks, right? So again, this maps to what a lot of other teachers do. Again, Justin Sanderko is, is my favorite. I recommend checking out his lessons on each of the individual major scale positions if you want to deep dive into any of them. This lesson is going to be a more of an overview on how you can use this concept overall of taking the cage chord shapes and playing a major scale within each of the cage chord shapes. So let's get into it. Um, all this stuff you can find at my website, playsongnotes.com. Thank you so much to all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. I hope all these PDFs are helpful. Um, and now that I have gotten into this world of making posters, uh, I'm thinking, how can I make that available to you all somehow? Um, physical merch is new to me, but um, that's something that I'm excited to get into one day too. But let's get into it. Jump ahead if you know what you're looking for, and I hope you find this helpful. I'll see you all on the other side, friends. Let's do it. Okay, so a quick crash course on the major scale, really quickly, is there's this idea of whatever, whatever key you're in, right? It can be any of the 12 notes. They each have a major scale. If we just take the key of G, right? This is a G note, this third string, third fret of the low E string. Um, that's a G. Now from here, if we follow a simple pattern, we get the major scale. You could play this only on the low E string, right? Okay, I just played every note in the G scale and I ended on another G up here. And I can go back down. Uh, that's a G. I used just one string to do it. Now, because of the way the fretboard looks, right, we have these, these intervals are mapped out, right? The one is the root, the root note. That's going to be the same, the note with the same name as whatever key you're in. You also could play the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, say using two strings, right? Right? Back down. Those are the same notes I played on just using the E string, but here I'm using two strings because it's a bit more convenient. And obviously where I'm getting to here is you could basically use uh, three strings to play this one octave scale. Now what you notice there is I was playing the same notes I did before, but the cool part is, the helpful part is, I didn't have to move my hand like this, right? That, that, that can be um, not practical for obvious reasons, right? If you can keep your hand still, that's, that's just um, very efficient and that's good. So this brings up the idea of chord or scale positions, right? Th there's this idea of I'm playing all the notes in the G major scale, just playing one octave here. Um, but I also can play that same scale if I was to go, say, over here to this G, right? Again, I didn't have to move my hand around. I sort of found a G note, I played a one octave scale. I also could do it right here. I'm gonna look at my cheat sheet and make sure I don't mess this up, but uh, this one would be, uh, whoop. Okay, again, I played all the notes in the G scale. So what I just did here, what I just did here, what I just did down here, those are all different scale positions. There exists many positions to play a scale on guitar, a major scale. Now, again, you might be saying, okay, that's great, but that sounds like show-off-y and complicated, and when would I ever need to know this stuff? And I was right there with you. But here is the real kicker, right? Now, folks will give those positions names, like form one or shape one or position one, but again, what does that mean? Like, like says who and where are you getting that number from? What does the number mean? And how am I supposed to remember that form four is this or shape three is that? But here's the cool part. When it comes to caged, the idea is if we take our open chord shapes, right? Our C major, our A major, our G major, our E major, and our D major. These are the only major chords that can be played with open strings, right? Where some of the strings are not being pushed down. You can take those chord shapes and you can move them up the fretboard 
and you can basically play other chords using a shape that you might recognize as a, uh, a D. For example, this one, right, a D, a D major chord, right? A long time ago, I watched a friend play Free Fallen by Tom Petty, and he was going like... And I was like, whoa. Right? All he's doing is going from second, third, second, which is a D major uh, chord, and it's also using the D shape. And he's sliding this D shape, but he's doing it up to 787. Right? And that's a G triad, basically. And if you go two more frets, that's an A triad. And this is what helped connect the dots with Cage for me very early on, was this idea of you can take a chord shape and you can slide it up. Another one is the, the A chord shape, right? If we were to slide this up, uh, say we slided it up to the fifth fret. Okay? Now, we, we're, we also have to slide up this fifth string, right? Because it's open when we play an A. But if we slide that up also, say we go one fret further, so we're gonna do first, third, 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 that's one half step up from A, which is an A sharp or a B flat. If we go one further half step, that's a B. If we go one further half step, that's a C. We can go up to a D, we can go to an E, we can go to an F, we can go to a G, we can go to an A, and it repeats, okay? The, re the repetition is a magic part. So that's how Cage works. It's these, these chord shapes that just repeat. I have a whole separate lesson on this and a whole separate PDF you can get over um, on my website. Now, here's the cool part, is no matter which of these chord shapes you're using, the Cage chord shapes, so say again, we're right here, 7999. This is an E major chord. It's using an A chord shape in the caged parlance of our times once again. But we can play a major scale based around that chord shape. And this is the main idea here. Okay, I just played a major scale. Let's do another one really quick. Say we're playing, um, that's an E. Let's go um, E if we go down down the fretboard a little bit. Uh, let's do the E, that, so this is a C, right? If we go a whole step up, that's a D. And a whole step again is an E, okay? This is the seventh fret root note. It's the same root note as this chord, okay? This is the A shape chord. This is the C shape chord. And that's the thing about cage is all these shapes connect, right? Same root note, but different chord shapes. But here we can play a, we can play a, um, a major scale as well. So I can do A, that's an E major scale played in the C shape, which is position three, according to my PDF. That also is an E major scale using the A shape, which is position four, according to my PDF. So that's the main idea here, is that for each of these cage chord shapes, you can play a different major scale based around that shape. And it's just super helpful to understand. Now, what, what is position one? Who's naming these things? Why are we starting with position one and, and where is it? Here is the best way I understand it, okay? You know how when you read, you read from top to bottom and left to right? I think with guitar, a helpful way to think about it is, you know, as we extend our arm and strum, we start with the thickest string. So what's the lowest note on guitar? What's the starting point note? I think this lowest E string, open, okay? It's an open E. That's like the starting, I would say, it's the lowest in pitch note for sure. And arguably, let's just say that's the starting note of all the notes on guitar. If we were to go from thickest to thinnest and from the end of the fretboard up to the top of the fretboard, that's like the starting point. Now, here's the deal. If we were to play a major scale using the lowest possible note that would allow us to play a major scale and not involve any open strings. And when I say open strings, I mean like if we were to play a, um, a G major scale, open A string, open fourth string, okay, and then open third string. Let's avoid any openness here because that, that makes things more complicated. Um, if we were to do a major scale and play it at the lowest possible place, the lowest possible shape, position, it's going to be this position right here, position one, okay, the E shape. It's based on this, this shape right here, which if you recognize this is an E major shape, just slid up so that I'm barring the second fret. Okay, this allows us to play. Okay, so because it's the first place that we can play, 
the major scale. If we're starting at the bottom of the lowest string and we're looking for that first opportunity, I think that makes sense to me that we'll call this position one. This is the first place you can possibly play it. Now, all the other position numbers, position two, three, and four, they're gonna be based on being an extension of the prior position. Here's what I mean by that. Look at shape one right here, position one. Okay, I just played one octave up to this note. Now, if I can also play a major scale from this note. Whoop. Okay, so this is position two because it's an extension of position one. And you can look at my chart here and see that. See that they're connected. That sort of... This note is in position one, and it's also the start of the... This is the lowest root note in position number two. And then likewise, with position number two, we can keep going. And then from this root note, we can make another scale going down. Whoop. Da, 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 da. Okay. And here, so this is the end of position three. This is the C shape. And then what's after C shape is the A shape. I already played this one. Okay, so that's position four. That's the A shape. And then position five, is going to take this this root note up here, and that's going to be in the um, in position five. But position five actually has another root note down here. Things start over again on the sixth string. Okay. Whoop. Um, I'm embarrassingly bad. Okay, that's position five. So I just played all the positions for you and I happen to be in the key of F sharp, but it doesn't matter. You can play those same positions in any key. Now, if we were to say, theoretically, start in the key of C and we were to say, okay, I wanna play a um, E shape scale in the key of, of C. Um, well, you'd have to find a root note that's on the sixth string for C. So that, that just involves looking at the sixth string and saying, where is a C? This involves you having to know your, your fretboard, like where, especially if you just take, you know, even if it's one string, if you learn the bottom string, where is the C? It's on the eighth fret, okay? You learn that and it lets you do a couple things. Number one, it lets you play a bar chord with that as the root note. So that's an E-shaped bar chord. Okay, eight, 10, 10, nine, eight, eight. And we can make a scale based on this shape. This is the E shape, which again, my, my PDF tells you this is position number one. The numbers don't really matter. I don't think that much. I think it's more helpful to learn the cage chord shapes. Recognize that, hey, if I'm playing this shape chord, here is the scale I can play. Okay, so that's how you would play um, the E shape in, the, in, the, in the, the scale or the key of C. Now, when I play C, I'm either doing open C, I'm doing three, five, 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 or I'm doing eight, 10, 10, nine, eight, eight, eight. So I don't need to know what position number it is. I don't think that really matters that much. If I'm playing this one, three, five, 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 I just know. Okay, that's a major scale. And I could even go to Line there. Um, so anyway, again, take the chords you know, different parts of the fretboard, and if you happen to know, hey, I like playing D up here on this 11, 10, 10. This is a nice little D triad I like to do. What if I want to play a little major scale based on this D root note? Well, I can just look at the at my chart here. Fine, this is a first string root note. Okay, that's position one. Okay, and I can play that D sort of scale there. So. This is how I recommend, um, this is one way I recommend looking at things when you're learning the major scale, okay? There's lots of ways to play the major scale in any given key, and I would recommend using these cage chord shapes as your sort of launching point, okay? Yeah, in a perfect world, you can play all these forwards, backwards, blindfolded, uh, you know, whatever, like drunk, uh, you can do. Do little complicated skipping third intervals like that. I can't do that, right? And here's how I'm approaching it. Here's some practical practice tips that I've picked up from watching a lot of other folks and just spending a few weeks playing here. Is, um, and a lot of folks say this. They're like, here's the five chord shapes. 
don't feel like you have to learn all these equally. Like start with one, maybe start with two. For me, the E shape and the A shape are the, are the two that are the most helpful. And the reason for that is those have their root notes on the sixth string and the fifth string, okay? And I just talked about this. For example, I can play C on the eighth fret of the low E string, C major bar chord, or a B, or an A, or a G, right? You can play so many with that shape. And then it's helpful to know if I'm playing the A, I can play an A chord, do that little run right there, go back to an A chord, it sounds good. Then the other one is the, e, the, the, the A shape, which is this one, okay? This is a D major chord using an A shape. So using, you, learning that E shape and that um, A shape. In my experience, those have been the natural first two to learn. From there, you can just be aware the others exist. And just that can be enough for now. Just worry about one or two if you're practicing your scales. And again, this concept, you don't need to know these back and forth. Just knowing it exists, exists make it, makes it super helpful. Okay, so um, if you look again on page uh, two, three, four, five, six of my PDF, I will show you um, the, the chord, the chord shapes with intervals on the top and the number finger numbers on the bottom. The finger numbers simply represent which finger you typically use or traditionally use when you're playing that chord. I'll just do one of these for an example. The key of A, um, if we do an E-shaped chord on the fifth fret, right? An A major chord. If we're to play this scale, right? And we look at our finger numbers. Index is one. I'm not gonna do my middle by itself, that would be rude. This is two, this is three, this is four, okay? Look at this chart, and you're gonna have to do your homework with, with regard to um, you know, which key you wanna play and where you wanna start. But say our fifth fret is where our middle finger is gonna be. Okay, that's gonna be an A major, because this is an A note, this is gonna be an A major scale. Now, so the one, the, the first finger is going right here. The reason that the two, the second note, um, the note with the two in it on the low E string is has the black background is because it's a root note. So that's gonna be our home base. Okay, so we can go up. So second finger, fourth finger. Then we go first finger, second finger, fourth finger, okay? First finger, third finger, fourth finger. So that's just one octave. It's from the root note to the root note. These are one octave apart from each other. Get my PDF on the 12 notes if you don't know the idea of an octave. Basically these notes repeat, okay? Whoop. <laughs> Whoa, man. These notes repeat, I'm, uh, I do bad at demo sometimes. But anyway, uh, first, uh, second finger, fourth finger, first, second, fourth, first, third, fourth, first, third, fourth, second, fourth, first, second. And then we can go from second to fourth and back to second if we want. That's basically how you do these fingering guides. Some of these chord positions are more crazy than others, but they're all using these four fingers, okay? Now, the one thing I'll say about finger positions is use these as guidelines, like I always say here you can deviate from these sometimes because sometimes you're going to either be in a weird position on your guitar or you're going to be wanting to slide or do something crazy and you're going to need to favor a certain finger to set you up for something good. So don't be locked in by these chord finger um, mappings. This is more for just like if you're developing the skill of finger dexterity and being able to make a clean sound, it's important that you do this. Right? But then once you start learning riffs and everything, like I'm learning this riff right now, it's in the key of D. Okay? I've been practicing that riff a lot. Um, I'll save it for a future lesson, but the main thing I want to say about that is I am doing my finger position in there based on the needs of that riff. I know from this finger, I need to do my fourth thing, my third finger, and then slide it up to second to fourth. Okay, so I might be violating certain rules here and there, but it's all about context. Um, so the finger finger positions are just guidelines, but again, the intervals are the really important part. I think it's super important to learn this. No matter which key you're in, the one is going to represent your root. Okay, that's your home base. The one, the three, the five together are going to make up the major chord. Okay, you 
with multiple ones and threes and fives usually in each chord. But as long as you have just one of each, that makes it a major chord. Now all the other tones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay, all the other tones are part of the major scale. So if you're practicing the complete major scale, that's fine, practice them all. But just know that the one, the three, and the five are gonna sound the most stable. And that just has to do with the way that our ears work and, and what we, you know, we're, we're raised in a uh, Western society where major, uh, major chords sound good. I'm not a musicologist here, um, but just know intervals are helpful to learn because as you change key, it doesn't matter which key you're in, the intervals are a constant. The one, the three, the five are always a major chord, right? Um, adding a flat seventh, which is the seven, you see, that's a seven. Flat means down in pitch. Again, see my lesson on the 12 notes if you need to review this. If we add a flat seventh, which is a, the, take a seventh and go down one note. If we add that to a one and three and five, we get a seventh chord. And this is something you've probably played and not even realized necessarily. And it took, I just learned this relatively recently is that um, when you see like C7 or A7 or E7, that's seven, it's not the seventh in the major scale. It's the flat seventh, um, the, the, they call that the minor seventh, right? That blew my mind at first because you know, it's just hiding in plain sight. It says like, well, that's, a, that's an A7. It just must just be the seventh degree of the scale, but it's actually, um, it's the minor seventh or the flat seventh. And when you see a, 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 a chord and it says like C major seven, this B right here, this open second string, is a B. B is the seventh tone of the major scale in the key of C. Um, that makes it an a, a C major seven. If I wanted to play a C seven, I would add my pinky on the third string to add that B flat note, which is the flat seventh. I'm getting way off topic here, but um, again, all this stuff connects major scales, intervals, major chords, seventh chords, major seventh chords, scale positions, caged, it all connects. It's the cool part about learning music is you learn these principles and it sort of illuminates the other principles that coexist alongside it. And um, it's just like removing the fog of war and a big map of Warcraft 2 or Starcraft or whatever. And you start to you start to connect those dots and everything. An analogy, I'm gonna close this out. Uh, this is what I've been thinking of as I've been playing this lesson is when I was in college, I went to University of Maryland and we would go into Washington, D.C. sometimes. It was like a half hour away if you drive. We would always take the metro. And I was never the one um, in my group of friends. I was never the responsible like travel logistic coordinator guy. I would just we'd go to a concert. All right, we're going to 930 Club. I'm going with my friends like I'm following them. They know how to get there. I trust them. Um, there was a few places we would go. We'd go to the 930 Club. We'd go to Chinatown for Caps games. We would go to... Um, Adams Morgan sometimes, you know, and then a friend lived down, down in other place other times. So there was like four or five spots in DC we would go to. And I knew that the Metro would get you there and I could probably figure it out if I needed to, but I had no idea where these places were relative to each other, okay? I was never driving um, and the Metro just like is a magic train that takes you where you wanna go. And it was funny because as I got older and I started having to take myself down to D.C. and I started working in D.C. and driving sometimes, metro other times, bus other times, and I became a more responsible adult, like naturally figure out like, oh, the 930 Club is like here. And oh, the zoo is here. And Adams Morgan is here. Oh, it all makes sense now. Like basically that fog of war was being lifted. Fog of War might be the wrong metaphor. Um, I'm thinking about like video games where there's a map and there's darkness and you might have like, you have, you know, visibility at this part of the map and visibility at this part, but there's a lot of darkness and mysterious blackness in between and you don't know, you don't know how things connect to each other. It just all seems like a world of chaos. But the more you can illuminate the fog or move the fog away or whatever the metaphor is here, you realize these things are all connected, okay? And that's really what I want to um, bestow upon you here with this stuff, with this guitar stuff and the scales and scale positions and caged. And like I said, the major major chords and seventh chords and major seventh chords and intervals. And it, it's all related. And um, this is a helpful thing. So I think I've overstayed my welcome with this video. Perhaps get this PDF over at my website. Again, page one gives you all this in a single page. I think it's helpful to see that basically this position right here exists right here, okay? But what's highlighted is the blue here. And then this position, this blue one exists right here. You can just see the patterns the same, right? The same notes. 
um, but I'm, I'm highlighting it a different shape based on the cage shape. Um, and on the final page, I have, it's very similar to page one, but up here, there's a version with nothing highlighted. And this is just to show you the chaos of the fretboard, but also the order. I mean, this is a pattern. If you look at it long enough, you're gonna see things repeat every 12 frets. For example, this, this first fret is missing the B string note. Where else do you see that? Where else do you see that? Oh, right here. 12 frets later, it repeats. And the whole thing just repeats every 12, every 12 frets, it all repeats. Um, yeah, so check that out if you're, if you got my earlier PDF. This is one of the same concept I, I posted online on my website on Patreon a few weeks ago. This is the earlier draft of the same thing. Um, I just was playing with my graphic design program and I had a lot more fun laying it out this way. I think these numbers are easier to read and the colors help and all that sort of stuff. So it's been fun iterating on this. Thank you all very much for the support and um, I hope this is helpful for you. I have a lot more stuff I want to get to uh, related to all this. I'll get to it in time. You know, I'm going to get some get to some songs that have been have been piling up. So um, I'm going to take off now. I'll see you on the next one. Take care, my friends. Thank you so much for the support. Thanks for watching this far. I'll see you around. Bye-bye.